It's you and Lisa sitting on some stairs. Yeah. And we're going to pull that up here because I think this is so iconic. Yeah. We're just allowed to be vulnerable. And I know it sounds so simple, but working predominantly with women, we we talk about our emotions differently. How do we think about patients in a way that would nurture them, that would help them? Like I think having that woman voice and brain sort of helps as well. So it's amazing. Um, Just and- in terms of some of the challenges that you're experiencing, yeah. is that more so being a woman? Hello, how are you? I'm really good. How are you, Chad? I'm great. Love to do this. So uh, yeah, very excited. And I do say that a little bit when I have a guest on, but I generally am. But for, for to do this and particularly where I want to go, because I do have a little surprise that I haven't mentioned to you just before we get started. But yeah, nothing that's going to put you under the pump, but I just, it's something that I love and uh, I want to share that with you as we get going. But to kind of start off, anyone in Australia and anyone in the industry, I think all the patients would know who you are. But for those who are kind of tuning in and like, who is this big deal that we have on here? Yeah. In your own words, what you want to share and how you want to introduce yourself. Are you able to, you have to share with us, please? Yeah, sure. That is very humbling, I have to say, and probably a huge assumption. (laughs) But um, I'm B. Muhammad. So I'm the head of patient advocacy and government relations at Astrid Dispensary, the first female led dispensary in Australia and you know I come from 12 years of public policy health policy background but aside from I guess my work identity who I truly am as a person at the Mm. core of what I love to do is I genuinely believe that um, there is a way for public health I guess policy to benefit us as everyday citizens so that's what I'm truly about okay um so yeah that's that's who I am awesome we we chatted first in like 2020 right you and you and Lisa on a call with me when I was just getting started you guys were kind you girls were kind of early as well and I remember that initial call so yeah it's good to see how time has moved on and you've already touched on it yeah but one thing that was posted around two months ago, yeah, it's you and Lisa sitting on some stairs, yeah, and we're going to pull that up here because I think this is so iconic, yeah. Can you, for, for, as an outsider, yeah, when I when I saw that, we reposted and I was just like, I love that. I absolutely love that. And that, anyway, what is that like now for where you are And what was going on in this picture? So what was going on at the time? Can you take us in? Sure, I can take you in. I mean... Am I blowing it up too much? Am I like putting putting too much on it? It's funny because that photo, me and Lisa, when I posted that, we were both like, oh, my God, we looked 10 years younger. So I almost feel like that's just going to, you know, validate that. No, so that was during covid 2020, as you mm-hmm. said, um, yeah, Lisa was building the dis- the flagship dispensary in in Melbourne, Chapel Street. It was COVID lockdown, and if I'm being honest, we were the only business that was building something while people were moving out, like of Chapel Street, which everyone knows if you lived in Melbourne is a very busy, you know, shopping precinct. So it was a really weird vibe like it was such an eerie feeling of like setting up something in the middle of the entire world shutting down and still believing that it would all work out you know kudos to Lisa who every day rocked up 12 hours a day just you know making sure that everything went on but yeah it's so that picture was us having a break and I remember Lisa was like shit you know we're doing this though right isn't that the, that's where you guys are at the start. That's what I'd yeah. seen, like the start. And so, and I think the, the reason why I love seeing that story evolve, right? And so think about people who, who are now watching this and all they see is what you girls are doing now and the wider yeah. team. No one sees that day one. 
right? So go back to that time because getting started and then believing where you can go, that's what I think the message here is we, this is around understanding what it's like to be a woman in cannabis, but it expands beyond that, right? And I, I would it's, say, you, sorry, you go. No, I was going to say, I think the doubt that we had was actually not about the dispensary. I think, like you said, being women in the industry, like, yep. and don't get me wrong, we came from Canopy where, you know, like women yes. were actually quite supportive. It was really diverse and everything. But outside of the company, me and Lisa were like, shit, this is not a diverse industry. So I think the doubt was actually like, like I was going to say fuck, but fuck how people were actually going to perceive the fact that we are making a statement by saying that we are going to be the first female left yeah. dispensary. Yeah. So, so yeah, the starting part is actually what we forget. I think people know now Astrid is a brand and, and Astrid is who we are, but Correct. there were many tears, there were many incidents and all yeah. that stuff. And you would know when you're starting up, like people can be really critical of what you're doing so and to this day yeah and to this day if, if you do want to share anything about what astrid is doing now um because as i said like everyone the branding is amazing and what you have done many many supporters right industry-wide and now you've gone into if you've gone into a different area and i don't know if you want to share anything about that at the moment because we'd love to give you that opportunity because if patients are listening, you can signpost them or we can do that at the end as well. Just mindful of the Astrid story and how it continues to evolve. And as I said, as a supporter, if anyone's listening in, want to, want to ensure that they know where to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think Astrid now is Astrid Dispensary and Clinic as well. And yep. again, it's like I think being a startup, we've had to constantly, you know, Lisa's favorite word for the last three years. And sometimes I'm like, please don't ever use that word again is pivot. You know, I think the one thing I'll say is she's amazing at knowing when to pivot the business and like how to make sure that, you know, we we constantly think ahead, like during COVID and, you know, the fact that everyone was in telehealth and all that sort of stuff it's like we had to pivot and be like okay how do we actually think about the technologies that would allow patients to you know safely get the medication yeah. consults and all that stuff and then when COVID ended we were like people actually wanted to have the human to human contact again so then mm -hmm. we pivot we opened the second bar and store and we wanted to focus on the brick and mortar mm -hmm. after we did that Lisa was like oh my god there's so many clinics that are not actually making the patient journey easy you know five minute consults no duty of care all that sort of stuff and we were already working very very closely with Shu from day one like you know Dr. Yep. Shu's been with us from day one and she has continuously tried to make sure that she maintains you know your your normal 25 minute consult actually getting really thorough time with the patients and so Lisa was like how about we take on Shu's team and and obviously started Astrid Clinic now Excellent. so I think it's been great because what we wanted to do was making sure that end to end from the prescribing to the yep. dispensing of it that patients had a really good experience and how's it all going it's been going good. If I'm being honest, you know, me and Lisa had a bit of a cry yesterday. <laughs> so it's been good. It's been a year, but I think it's a tough year. I mm. don't know whether it's just us. I don't know whether it's industry. It's been challenging because it's getting more and more. Like there's more mm -hmm. supply, more um, um, dispensaries. There's a mm -hmm. lot that sort of is you know coming mm. up which is great because that means it obviously widens the choice and options for patients mm -hmm. however it's hard because you know patients leave and then patients come back because when they leave they realize like that certain things are not you know the way it's supposed to be so it also then the choice and the options sometimes can be confusing for patients as mm -hmm. well um so it's been great. It's been the biggest year of growth for us, more personally than commercially. Like we've all had to learn like this year, we're putting ourselves first. Like we're actually looking yep. after ourselves. 
you know so that was a huge realization because like when we spoke about before the burnouts like yeah. every year yeah. in November so I think that's probably the biggest growth like that's why me and Lisa had a bit of a cry yesterday because we realized yeah. like actually when we put all that stuff aside yeah like our own self is more important first and then yeah. our families and then the work that we do okay Could, it, uh, how much of a so what you've just in some ways one of the key points that is all over the branding as well is the first female led dispensary first female dispensary yeah what is the significance of it being female leadership so what does that mean for things like like what difference does it have in terms of your place and the team's place compared to maybe where you've been somewhere else? What is that like? I think that's an amazing question. What it's like is we're just allowed to be vulnerable. And I know it sounds so simple, but working predominantly with women, we we talk about our emotions all the time. And I think that's so important in a space where we're doing so much for patients, you know, because essentially as an industry, we're actually serving others, you know, we're serving for the wider good. So it's been great because the first thing is we're vulnerable. I think the second thing that I love being around women is the creativity that exists and the way of thinking is, a bit less logic, you know. We do have a couple of men in the leadership team, which we need when we need logic. But when we need, you know, how to sort of do things differently, how do we think about patients in a way that would nurture them, that would help them? Like, I think having that woman voice and brain sort of helps as well. So it's amazing. Um, and, yeah, and what. You know, to be fair, like what really drew patience to us when they first came was when me, Lisa and Judy, one of our nurses, when we first started opening our doors and they came into the dispensary, a lot of our patients who have been with us from day one said, this is the first place I've ever been heard. This is the first place I can trust, you know. So I guess in a way that's what women actually can be good at sometimes, even though some people might disagree, we can be good at listening as well. So. I would definitely say that that's a strength. And and one of the things that I think is super important to touch upon and highlight is that you can talk about emotions and you can be vulnerable, but you still are smashing it and you still get the job done. So the productivity is there, right? And that, that, I think that's a key lesson to highlight that it's not getting bogged down in emotion, but it's having space for that to be present alongside mm -hmm. a profit-driven business, which continues yes. to scale and exceed. And that wraps it up for me to say to your branding is the first female dispensary yet, but really it's the, it's, 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 it's bigger than that. I would say it's bigger than that in the industry. It is bigger than, bigger than that. And that picture that I keep going back to, but that's what it starts to. And that's what I think can touch and speak to anyone out there, but particularly women that are like, who can I lean on in terms of my dreams? Yeah. So who's gone before me, that Roger Bannister effect to then be able to go to it. It makes it possible for me. Yeah. So that picture, that's why I go back to it because that's hope. No one wants to talk about those early days and what it means and the tears, the dreams. They want to see where you are now and Tall Poppy probably wants to try to rip you girls down. Yeah? <laughs> Just saying. Yeah? Australian no, I culture. Mean, that, is yeah? So, that is so true because what we realized when we first attended our first conference, I still remember this, you know, this was like two years ago, our first conference, Suddenly, all these women in the industry who were working for other companies came to us and started sharing their, I guess, experiences and challenges. And me and Lisa were like, oh, wow, like, you know, people actually go, thank you for doing what you're doing and making us feel yeah. like we can also be heard and seen within the industry as women. So I think for us, it's, it's like I said, it's constantly been a humbling process. Like it truly has. So yeah. What's well, amazing. That's amazing. What other pro like obviously your your focus, I think 
your role within Astrid also gives you a lot of opportunity to look at how you can advocate for wider issues. You know, you're a big part of Drive Change. See you going around the different states and talking to Parliament, et cetera. If you're to give yourself that little pat on the back at the moment, or just like so people can get a bit of a bit more of an understanding and then come and follow you um on Instagram, LinkedIn, or wherever. But I imagine it's going to be Instagram. And if you're happy with that, we'll put these links up and you can share that with us. But can you share a little bit more about what kind of drives you and where your focus is? Wow, what kind of drives me? I mean, this even goes back to how I came into the industry, if I'm being honest. Awesome. Um, so you know, I, for five and a half years, worked with patients or families in Australia who dealt with polypharmacy and pharmaceutical drug overdoses. And Can you just explain polypharmacy, what that means? Yeah, so polypharmacy, I guess, was the issue of, like, patients being prescribed multiple medications, you know, so it's quite common if you have chronic pain, you obviously will be prescribed opioids, but then because you can't sleep, you'll be prescribed sleeping medications. And because you're also suffering from potentially anxiety or depression, you could be on benzodiazepines. So we were starting to see a huge issue of over prescribing of medications, which then led to polypharmacy, which then led to coroners across the um, states and territories of Australia going, something's happening. More people are actually dying from pharmaceutical drugs than they are from heroin or any other illicit mm -hmm. drugs. So long story short, it's a very weird story, but Heath Ledger's dad started an organisation because of what happened to his son, and he had tens of thousands of families writing to him going, this is happening to my daughter, to my son, to my father. And my." so I put my hand up, packed up my car when I was working in Canberra. And decided How old were you then? I was 27. 27. Yeah. yeah. And So something got yeah. lit inside of you. Yeah. Something got lit. I was working, to be fair, I was working in federal government, for the Minister for Health, who was tenured, he was sick then. And I was like, I don't think this is where I need to be. I need to be changing things from outside of the government. So the universe presented. And long story short, I spent five and a half years doing that. And to be really, really honest, was so blessed with the families, with their stories, um, with state government buy-in. I remember that one meeting I had in Greg Hunt's office with a family who lost their son with Kim Ledger there. And we just went, we want you to, at the next COAG, which is the council, where they meet with all the health ministers and we want a commitment that you will reschedule coding, you'll start a um, safe script, which is that prescription monitoring system, and you'll actually look at reducing the pack sizes for some of these medications in question. So that was all great. It was, we got the changes that we wanted, but after five and a half years of coroner's report coming to my desk and seeing people overdose from it, I was personally not in a very good place. It started to affect my personal relationship. I felt as though I couldn't mm -hmm. stop the fact that people were dying from this. Mm -hmm. I even remember going to pharmaceutical companies and going, let's, Let's work together. And so I almost felt helpless and just burnt out, really. So then, mm -hmm. so then, yeah, Ben, who's the uh, managing director of Canopy Grove at that time, and Chris Murray, who's still my mentor, who was my Canadian boss, heard me on a podcast talking about this, and they were like, we need this chick in the cannabis industry. So, so I joined Canopy awesome. in two. 19 so I've been yeah I've been in the industry since since early 2019 so Chris was our first guest so interesting yeah good man he, I just, he I just spoke to him man. I just spoke to him actually it's so a bit of a shout out to Chris Murray uh, Chris Murray is generally the reason why I do what I do part of the reason and I still am doing what I'm doing because awesome. it is quite challenging sometimes so mm, mm. Would you say there's a lens, a gender lens for any of those challenges at all that, that you would want to share? 
um, or that you could share. And again, not trying to pressure you at all, but I'm just, and if I'm pushing too hard on any areas, please just give me a little sign. But I'm just curious. Um, yeah, is there agenda left in what sense? Oh, just in terms of some of the challenges that you're experiencing, yeah. is that more so being a woman? Yes and no. I think what I'm starting to see now, especially since the legalized cannabis party have sort of come into the space, I have to say that has been really helpful. However, when I was a canopy and even the early days of Astridge, it's just your typical government relations, I guess, thing that you have to face as a woman. You walk in, you're a woman, you're a woman of colour, and people sort of immediately sometimes go, you know, like it's always like a question of your qualifications first. I remember a few meetings where I'm there with government or, or politicians like advisors, and the first question is always like, what's your background? You know, what's your professional background? So I've always struggled with that because to me it's like I shouldn't have to answer that if I'm in the room and if I'm in the room to talk about an issue yeah. that is affecting everyday citizens and voters, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, so I think that was definitely the hard part of doing government relations in the early days of, of I guess, the cannabis industry coming, you know, mm -hmm. in place. But more recently I've realised the complete opposite. I'm actually working with majority of women in the space. I mean, mm -hmm. I work really closely with Fiona Patton and Rachel Payne, but even mm -hmm. like, you know, working with MPs like Jeremy in New South Wales and David Adeshek here in Victoria and even having Matt Bryan a few times, it's so different. Like it's actually quite refreshing that for the first time people are just hearing me for the fact that they want to know and they want to do better because they're all here for the right reasons. So yeah. Yes, I had those challenges at the start, but it's almost like I finally have come to a point where mm. those relationships are so, like, empowering. Powerful. One thing that I like to think about at times is that, do you remember playing Mario when you were young? Yeah. Of and you got to go through like level one to level two and you got to get through the tunnel, but to, to get along the way, you got to kind of pick up some things. Yeah. Yes. So you pick up little tools and skills as you go along and maybe there's a bubble around you with, with that little segue, which is quite odd, but like thinking about that in terms of things you've acquired that you could never, that you're now in a position where things have changed around you. And then you've also changed as well. What are some, and while I'm giving you some thinking time, as I expand this out, what are a few lessons that come to mind yeah, in that evolution of yourself, being a woman of colour, seeing that these credentials come up. Because again, the importance of this is, this is a growing podcast. We're still very small. So please subscribe, like, share if you're doing this and listening at the moment. But if someone's out there and they're listening to this, this could be that thing. And and as you were talking, I, I there's a quote, that is super powerful for me and it is the world doesn't and I, I may butcher it but it's like the world doesn't need another idea what the world needs is more people to be switched on and so clearly you got lit up so you got lit up and that mission burns and it keeps you going to where you are now you may be and it's likely you are inspiring other people out there as well and so if they're starting out they're facing challenges they're in a situation where they're being criticized. They're facing gatekeepers to say, what are you doing here? Are you qualified? What's going on? Like I remember getting, when I was getting started in the admin offices and I, I got a thousand no's one year, I counted them a thousand. Um, like what has come up for you? So what are some of those key lessons that you think could be important to share with others? That is a big question. Big question, but it's the perfect question to ask me exactly as where I am currently at in my life. Like the last 15, 18 months of my life, you know, and this is eventually why I had to move to Byron, is doing what I've done in the last 12 years, you know, be it 
the cannabis industry or the pharmaceutical industry. I've worked in a lot of health projects where you see the injustice and a lot of things happening to people. I was just focusing on that. And in a way, I wasn't building my base to be confident when I was in that room sometimes, you know. So when it came to the medicinal cannabis industry, I can't explain what made me sort of feel like I have to build myself first. But it just happened like last year, September. Actually, I know what happened. Last year in September, I was invited to talk at Mardi Gras. I went to Nimbin. I spoke to Michael Bottlestone and I shared my story about growing up in Singapore, never having a voice, growing up as a Muslim woman, never being heard or seen in my family, never could have an opinion. And I was just sharing these stories with Michael and he just looked at me and he just went, I hope you see your magic I hope you realize who you are as a person wow. is so beautiful and so when all it takes is that one person right and this is what we're doing now we're sharing this and we're making that one person feel like it is possible yes. and Michael just said yeah and Michael just said to me like keep what you know keep doing what you're doing but yeah. but build yourself first yeah. and when he said I actually need it at that point in my life where I was going through a lot of things personally and lost a lot of lost a lot of things externally. I didn't lose myself, but I lost a lot. But like I just needed someone to come to me and be like, you've got this, but you can only do this if you just look within, build yourself up again, and nothing can bring you down. Like Michael was like, B, can you imagine the shit I've been through in my life, you know, running this movement? And I remember him sharing stories and I'm like, Man, he's so right. So for, for me, my advice to anyone, be it industry or outside of the industry, is if you have that inner fire in you, that inner calling, we all know that. Like we all know what our purpose and our life dharma is. It's always been there. You know, that's why we we're sort of here. But we sort of maybe allow our limitations in a way or we sort of don't feel like we can do it. It's just about trusting yourself and by you know obviously we can talk about the tools but like it was just things like mindfulness and I got into cold plunging I constantly yeah. was sit in discomfort mm -hmm. I had to constantly sit in discomfort yep. so that when I was sitting in a room and if someone was questioning me or I felt like someone was being condescending I just sat in that discomfort and don't allow it to change yep. who I am as a person so super powerful Super powerful. You said that when he when he mentioned that to you, it seemed like the inner, inner commentary at that time was that you're so right. And so you were able to internalize that, leverage that belief to then have belief in yourself. Is that right? Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I used it is. To and it's, it's so interesting because, I mean, I was then staying with David Halpin as well for that week in Nimbin. And, you know, he obviously have seen a lot in his, you know, when he was a magistrate and he became a Buddhist. And so it was almost like that whole week was a revelation for me. I was like, I do so much, but I never for one stop and go, A, I'm doing great. B, I'm doing something. And C, it's like, shit, I'm actually good. You know, because growing up, again, it's all that cultural stuff. And maybe not cultural, it's all relative. Maybe, you know, we all go through that. It's like depending on your upbringing and how mm -hmm. you've been conditioned. Like if there's ever a time in your workplace that someone said, well, actually, you're not very good, that itself would have been enough for you to doubt, doubt yourself for the rest of your working life. Two junctures, right? Junctures. I got told yeah. when, and I don't mean to sidetrack, but yeah. I think there's there's ways that it can be. Ideally, one of my messages when I used to work with young potential, like a, mainly younger men I used to work with and I had experienced was that at times we need to leverage someone else's belief to believe in ourselves, right? And one of the problems is, is that there's no belief in a lot of young people and young adults as we're kind of growing up because we don't know what we do. We don't know how we're making sense of it. Generations are changing. Like I at times think when we're, and again, and I don't want to go too off track, but you're in a situation where you're listening to young people talk at the moment at times and what they're studying. And one of the questions I ask is, do they talk to you about whether that job is going to exist in the future? Right? 
who knows? And so one of the things, yeah. if you're building, so if you're if you're starting out, you're going to trip and fall. You're not going to have belief. You're going to hopefully have this vision that you're going to move along from. You'll be able to leverage some wise words from Lisa and you'll be able to pivot along the way as well, right? Because it's the key word in pivoting. It's, yeah. Pivoting. It's, it's so true. I think the one thing I will say I've been really blessed with my entire life in my career, my purpose and what I do. I've always had a supportive, I mean, I don't like the word boss, but like, you know, person who's believed in me from my first job in Canberra at 24, out of mm-hmm. my postgrad, my, my first boss was like, I saw your name, tell me about your name, like, so that, and then, and then obviously even in the work that I did in Canberra, and then obviously Chris Murray again, not that I want to try and mention his name as many times as I can, and then Lisa, and then just everyone in the industry now, there are yeah. people that, you know, like, just, yeah. yeah, so I think it's so important to have that person that's like, you got this, you can yeah. do this, in society, and I, I don't want to digress, but I think the hard thing in society now is like this. We're all just like, you know, mm-hmm. we're not going to check in and be like, hey, what do you need? Are you okay? Like, you know, it's it's more yeah. of that. That's amazing. Anyway, we digress. <laughs> no, no, I think this is, yeah, I think it's it's crucial. And as you're reflect, as you're talking, some of the things that are coming up for me, most of my life, I was in like female dominated professions, right? I worked in after education, I went into social work. And so I always, I think, had a female boss, always. Mm. And I remember I went over to the UK. So I went to the UK when I was like 27, 28, I can't remember. And I went over there and I had this amazing boss and still keep in touch with her now. Um, and if you're listening, hello. Um but I remember one like so important day is that like, so we were dealing with what was called section 47, section 47 assessment. So children in significant, at, 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 at significant risk of harm. So in one of the most deprived boroughs in the UK, intergenerational trauma, substance misuse, family violence, a lot of other stuff that don't have the time to go into at the moment. And pretty green as well right I was pretty fresh out you know I'd had two years experience not actually a lot still learning and in many ways and I remember I just had she was so available for me with questions and I think it was about after four months or five months she said I'm not telling you what to do anymore you've got to go and start making these decisions because she was just available all the time and I'd come up and I'd have this question and you're dealing with people's lives. You're dealing with attachment and how do you balance? Again, I'm, I'm going too far into it, balancing risk versus it. But she just said to me, yeah, okay, time. But she was always there to support. And so, yeah, very lucky to have women who have guided guided my path. Um, and to hear you talk and the, the wisdom coming out, and the soul coming out, I'm I'm hoping that, you know, a lot of people uh, are connecting with this. So thank you. I know we're short of time, so I kind of want to finish up with a few questions and then just see what your responses are and, and see how we go to, to kind of finish it off. And I want to kind of bring it back in some ways to cannabis and happy to focus on Australia as well. But how do you see the industry catering to women's needs at the moment? Like, what would you say there? If it was like quite fire chat, like 45 seconds to answer, whatever comes into your mind, like, what do you see as the industry supporting women's needs? I think really it's a simple answer, just R&D. You know, I think it's it's something that if we have real world data on like, you know, I mean, again, a shorter answer to this is we all know like women, they receive later diagnosis and it's always like at an interventional point. You know, I remember when we first started Astrid and I'm talking to women in their late twenties with endometriosis or women's like reproductive health, like most of them end up in like hysterectomies, which it was devastating to watch because you just go, you just sometimes want to see things happening at a preventative stage yeah. rather than, you know, so I think, we're so focused now at the industry of like, let's treat conditions and indications and things like that, which is great. Look, we've come a really long way. Accessibility is 
great now, but I think there's an opportunity to stop and pause and go, well, if that's the disease that's happening, how can we address this sooner? So preventative staff looking at women's health, I think is a huge opportunity. And I'm really passionate about that because I think as a healthcare system, we need to, we need to actually prevent the disease. Yeah. You know, how would that happen? So, so how would you think like early intervention in some ways, right? If we can call it that or preventative healthcare or preventative measures could then be introduced into this space when we're looking at regulated and scheduled medicines, like how does, how can that fit in? I think that could fit in, especially with, you know, again, the, the industry and the ability of even the prescribers or practitioners, like they have a real opportunity here to sort of slightly move away from how general practice have been, yep. again, as sort of treating that symptom. So again, if there's an opportunity for like, you know, the prescribers in this, in this industry to be like, well, when we're talking to the patients, how thorough can we be so that we can understand how can we treat them now yeah. as opposed to, you know, so even, you know, I guess with endometriosis, it's like, it's obviously inflammation. Yes, CBD is really helpful, but how can we also equally talk about other things relating to inflammation, like the food that they eat and and whether there might be other things that keeps the inflammation in their body, like, you know, therapy or counseling. So all these things, you know, I've always believed that the cannabis industry would change how healthcare is being perceived. Mm -hmm. Like we've been so stuck in this symptom treatment that we sometimes I want to say had the opportunity, but today because I'm talking to you and I'm feeling really positive, we still have that opportunity to actually, you know, yeah, to to do that. So I don't know if I answered that well, but I think it's like, yeah, I think what the industry needs to sort of realize is we we can do this. We can actually mm. start, you know, that conversations earlier and actually look at yep. this from an Ill, early intervention sort of perspective. Yeah, amazing. And I know we're finishing. I'd love. I could go for another hour. There's no. I got so many more things that I wanted to ask. Um, I'm so grateful for your time and your wisdom coming through. Where would you like people to find you? Where would you like people to look? Like, so yeah, give a little bit of a plug so people can go in the right way. Cause I imagine if I was out there listening, I'd be like, I wanted to go talk to her. Like, so what do you suggest? Where did I go? Yeah. So Instagram is definitely the best platform for me. So my be the change and we can definitely share that handle. The be the change is where I talk very honestly, very candidly, everything about the industry, cannabis patients all that stuff and then obviously you know for the purpose of any dispensary or clinic services just jump on our website astrid.health but those are the two ways to reach out and I love like to me stories connection that's sort of what right. keeps me going every day so fantastic final question who do you want to give a shout out to if any and anything to close and yeah who would you shout out I mean, come on, let's let's make a guess. Definitely my shout out is to Chris Murray. He's okay, gotcha. He's, yeah. He's been he's been my northern star, my moral compass, everything in this industry. So so right. thanks, Chris. Okay. Amazing. Thank you very much. This has been high living, and we have had an absolute joy having a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.